Our first Bible reading for today comes from Isaiah chapter 62, reading verses 1 to 5, and these words will serve as a basis of this morning's sermon. We hear, I will not keep silent because of Zion, and I will not keep silent because of Jerusalem, until her righteousness shines like a bright light, and her salvation like a flaming torch. Nations will see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You will be given a new name that the Lord's mouth will announce. You will be a glorious crown in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the palm of God's hand. You will no longer be called deserted, and your land will not be called desolate. Instead, you will be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land will be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so your sons will marry you. And as a groom rejoices over his bride, so your God will rejoice over you. This is the word of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's word that we're going to focus on this morning was the first Bible reading we heard from Isaiah chapter 62. If you guys get meditation on that word, let's pray. May the words of my lips and meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, who gives us a new name. Amen. Your friends in Christ. So it was William Shakespeare who first penned that phrase that he gave to his iconic character, Juliet. What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. But at the same time, rose has become so synonymous with both the flower and the name that you can't really separate these two anymore. And really, Names are not without meaning. Names have a lot of meaning, and, and names are very carefully selected and chosen and given. Names are important. When you think about it, I looked at it, and, and I wanted to see what were the, the top names. So you can always do this. What were the top baby names of 2021? And uh, for the girls, it was Olive. And why was Olive chosen as the top name? Well, Maybe one, it, it, it has that, that reference, kind of thinking of an olive branch, so maybe this is somebody who brings peace, or maybe it's for the fact that their family had some Greek heritage, as it is Greek in origin, or maybe you just think of an olive and that's a small, little, edible, delectable thing, and it's kind of cute, so maybe that's what I'll name my daughter. For boys, it was Liam. Liam was the top name of 2021, which is a short, and it's actually from... Um, Irish origin. It's a shortened form of Julium, which would be William for English speakers, and means strong-willed warrior and protector. And you can imagine, with the names given, the kids had absolutely no say over this. They don't get consulted and be like, hey, what, what do you want to be called? I mean, they say that, but I mean, honestly, the names that are given to us as children are probably most just a reflection of our parents' hopes and desires and expectations and preferences about us. As we enter into Isaiah chapter 62, we have to wonder if whether or not the Israelites are reconsidering their name, wondering if their names should be changed, because names do change, and you can go and legally change your name. The most common way that names are changed nowadays is through marriage. It's generally uh, the woman takes the last name of her husband. Not always the case. And when you look into why is this done, your first thought might be, well, it's tradition. We just have always done it. But the uh, poll surveys have come back that actually the main reason why this is done, still today, is because they understand that in getting married, there's a change in identity. That the two have become one. And they are now something new, something different. Responsibilities, priorities have changed. It really harkens back to what we believe, what God himself has said about marriage, what Jesus said, when he said, a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Taking on that new last name represents that change in identity, change in family, change of who you are. So the Israelites, they're known because of their, their ancestor, Jacob. Now Jacob's name, I guess in one way, was given very practically. It means someone who grabs a heel. 
Because when he was born, that's what he did. His older brother came out first, Esau, and Jacob was grabbing the heel of Esau when he came out. So he was named Heel Grabber. And the more you think about Heel Grabber, well, okay, it has a very practical, descriptive uh, nature of how he came into this world, but if you think of people who grab somebody's heel, you're kind of swiping at them and tripping them up and making them look like <coughs> Jacob certainly lived up to his namesake, and so the other way of understanding his name was deceiver. So for anyone else named Jacob here, I'm sorry. That's just an origin you name. And he had this name for a majority of his life until there came a moment when he was coming back to his homeland, and he literally wrestled with God, and he held on to God. He was holding God to his promises to protect him, to bless him, to watch over him, and to return him safely to this land. And so God then changed his name. He says, you're not going to be called Jacob anymore. No, I'm changing your name to Israel. Because that means you have struggled with God. And God even explained what this change meant. Because you have struggled with God and with men, and have prepaid. So Israel was this name referring to this, this one who struggles but holds on, and in the end they prevail. Well, the people of Israel had a lot of struggles. There's so many of them in the Old Testament. You just think about all the ways that they struggled against God. I mean, when you think about the Israelite people being rescued from Egypt and then given the law of God on Mount Sinai, they immediately struggle to keep it. No, in fact, it just takes days before they break their vows to God and instead go off and make another God and go worship that. They very quickly become an adulterous nation, a nation that has affairs, a nation that cheats on God. They also struggle against men. They had many, many enemies as they, they left Egypt. Even in Egypt, they had the enemies there of their slave drivers. But then going into the Promised Land, they fought against numerous different nations. And then even during Isaiah's lifetime, the Assyrians would come down and completely destroy the ten tribes of Israel and exile the rest. And they were standing at Jerusalem's gates when finally the Lord turned them away. But Isaiah prophesied the Babylonians will come and they'll finish what the Assyrians started. So did they really prevail in their struggles? It seems like they struggled against God, but ultimately were unfaithful and failed. They struggled against men and lost and became exiled, were without a home, and were pretty miserable. Maybe they were considering at that point we should change our name. We shouldn't be known as the one who prevails. No, we struggled and we're left desolate and we're left deserted. So these words in Hebrew, Azuba and Shemamah, we feel all alone and that we've lost everything. Do you feel your struggles against God and against men? Against people, it's not too hard to think of the people who don't exactly cheer you up and don't exactly lift you up. The people who actually seem like they actively fight against you. That they work to try to bring you down. That they want to take every opportunity possible to pick at you and poke at you and, and drag you down and make your life miserable. Maybe, I don't know why, but they're your enemies. But maybe even some of the people that really go after you and yet you struggle against them, make your life miserable, maybe they share your last name. Maybe they're part of your family. And maybe it's people who have abused you, neglected you, said some horrible, awful things that we would never want to repeat to anybody. They have not loved you. Your husbands have not loved you as Christ loved the church. Your wives have not followed your lead as the church submits to Christ. And you just feel like, why am I working so hard to do this? Why am I working so hard to keep these relationships in life when these people just take these opportunities to hurt me? And maybe for some of you, those marriages did end. 
And yet still, these people find every opportunity to hurt you and to make your life more difficult. And you struggle. You struggle with the heartache that continues to present itself, the heartache you continually have to deal with. And maybe you're feeling like the Israelites. Maybe you feel like my name should change into deserted. I should be called Azuba. Because I just feel like I'm all alone in this. I'm struggling by myself and I can't overcome. And when you struggle against humans, it's kind of natural to move on that I also struggle with God. That maybe as I've tried and I've worked so hard to reconcile and repair these relationships, to, to, to fix this marriage, yet constantly I find that no matter what I do, it's never enough. And in fact, I've gone and I've done the things. I've, I've, I've devoted my life to God. I, I've been at church on Sundays and I've, I've been reading the Bible daily and I've been saying prayers, prayers after prayers after prayers after prayers. And you know what? It doesn't get any better. And God, it just feels like you have completely deserted me, that I should be called a Zuba, and you've left my land just completely desolate, as if there is no one out there to help me, and everything in my life is kind of ruined. So call me Shenomah, call me desolate. Because I just have not overcome. So in to a people who are feeling like that, that we should change our name to something much more depressing, God speaks. God speaks to the prophet Isaiah, and he says to them, I will not keep silent because of Zion. I will not keep still because of Jerusalem until her righteousness shines like a bright light and her salvation like a flaming torch. Nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be given a new name that the Lord's mouth will announce. We want to call ourselves Azuba, we want to call ourselves deserted, we want to call ourselves desolate, we want to call ourselves Shemama. And God says, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm not going to let you say and just despair and fall into the fact that you think no one cares about you, no one loves you. No, I'm going to announce to you a new name. And maybe at first, when you think about names, it's like, well, it's just a grouping of letters. I mean, you, it's kind of like a new, new coat of paint on a rotting wall. I mean, you could give me a new name, but does that really change who I am? Well, when God speaks, stuff happens. At the very beginning, God spoke, and there it was. His very words created this world that we enjoy. And then God spoke again. It wasn't just that, oh, the head waiter comes back during this wedding at Cana and says, oh, well, I'm calling it the fine wine, and so it was fine wine. No, it was because Jesus said, take that water, serve it. And because of his words, it changed the best wine they possibly could have. When God speaks, things happen. And so God speaks to us, and he says, this is the new name I give you, and this is going to change you. You will be a glorious crown in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem in the palm of your God's hand. You will no longer be called deserted, and your land will not be called desolate. Instead, you will be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land will be married. So those names. Her delight is in her. In Hebrew, is Hapsavah. So God says, your new name is Hexabah because my delight is in you. This means that I actually pay attention to you, I focus on you, and that I delight in you. And I delight in you not just because you are so cute and lovable and, 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 and I care so much, but my delight is in you, which caused me into action, to come down into this world, to clothe myself with human flesh so that I could live under the law that you could not keep. The law that you continued to walk away from, the law that you continued to, to go off after other gods and cheat on me with. But I kept it for you. And I paid the price for all of your unfaithfulness, for all of your sins, that every single moment of that has been completely expunged from your record, and it's gone completely because of my faithfulness. And so instead, I have wrapped you in the robes of my righteousness. So in the perfection that I have won now, I have covered you with it. And so, of course, my delight is in you. 
that I raise you up just like a groom raises up her, his beautiful bride to put her on display and say, this is the one I cherish, this is the one I love, this is the one that I live for. And that's what God has done for us when he changes our name to the one whom my delight is in. We are Hephzibah. And he gives us another name, Merid, which in Hebrew is Beulah. Because God wants us to know you're not alone. Maybe you know of the promises that, that husbands and wives, they exchange on their wedding day, that I promise to be faithful, you love you, cherish you, support you, and sickness tell us until death do us part. God's vows are even better. Because he says, I am bringing you with me. And that I'm going to love you and serve you and be there for you even when no one else is. And God does not break his promises and he never neglects his vows. So God says to you, I am committed to you, that I am going to be with you, and it doesn't matter how bad this world gets and how bad life gets, I'm sticking with you so that you stick with me. We're going to be together because you are beautiful. You are married to me. This is what God has done to us as he gives those new names to Israel, as he gives those new names to us. And so today, it's like a wedding day where we get to rejoice. We get to rejoice over what our God has done for us. He has taken his delight in us. We are Hephzibah. And he has married himself to us, committed himself to us, robed us with his righteousness. We are Beulah. We are married. So today, you have a new name. You have a new identity because of what God has done for you because of what your relationship is with God. So he says to you, my delight is in you. I'm married to you. We are together. God be praised. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus.